Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatory. So you've seen this brigandine quite a lot of times on my channel. Uh, it's a nice piece of armour, I'm very fond of it and it's very effective. Um, and it was also a very popular type of armour, particularly in the 15th century and into the 16th century as well. And it had its roots in the 14th century coat of plates. Now a question which has come up a number of times under videos where I featured this is why are the steel plates, and so just so you're aware, just as Shad pointed out, this is not leather armour, in fact there's no leather here really except for the straps, um, why are the plates, the steel plates, hardened carbon steel, um, on the inside rather than the outside? Um, and that's a very good question and um, we don't really know the answer but the fact is that in Europe there was a tradition um, and a convention for putting the plates until we get to the so-called all-white harness and you know having a breastplate, sort of breastplate, um, there was a convention for putting the plates on the inside of the fabric. And yes, sometimes these were leather, but usually they were a type of fabric, um, sometimes layered. In fact, usually layered. Um, so you usually have a tougher fabric on the underneath and then a, a, a nicer fabric on the outside. And I suppose the question is, why did they put that on the inside? Well, when did this start with the coat of plates? So for anyone who doesn't know, in the 13th century, we should go all the way back to the 1200s now, a type of defence started to appear on torsos of knights, so men-at-arms, who were otherwise pretty much covered in male armour, chain mail armour. So they've got mail on their legs, mail on their arms, mail on their bodies. They're wearing a full, you know, full length, long sleeved, male mittened um, uh, jacket or coat, if you want to call it that, hauberk um, is the correct term. And they're male chausses or legs, okay, which cover their feet as well. And then uh, it went around their head, um, so covered their uh, coif, covered their uh, neck and head. And then on the top, they stuck. Uh, various types of helmet, usually a great helm, but sometimes underneath the mail of the coif there was a cervelier which eventually evolved into the bassinet um, as well. So, um, on their bodies they presumably found in the 13th century either, and I wrote my degree dissertation on this subject, um, but either because of um, arrows or crossbow bolts or because of lances or just because of weapons in general possibly partly because of contact with the Mongols and various other people from outside of what we conventionally call Europe. Um, so new types of armour technology being experienced, lamellar armour and other things uh, being noted um, and emulated perhaps to some degree. But for all of these potential reasons, and I'm not saying it's for any one or any particular balance, but for all of these possible reasons, they developed the coat of plates. And the coat of plates was a series of large iron plates which were riveted almost always, not always, but almost always on the inside of a covering. Now the covering could be leather, it could be fabric of various sorts, um, but the plates were riveted on the inside usually, okay, and one of the most famous examples we see of this is the St. Morris um, statue, where, the, where you can clearly see the outline of plates riveted on the inside of a garment which is over the top of the male hauberk. Um, now what's interesting is that this development of the plate around the torso, and obviously the torso is a large, certainly from the front, relatively flat surface that is very vulnerable to arrows and lances. Um, this seems to be one of the first things really to get plated. But if we look at the medieval artwork, what's often got lots of attention in the medieval artwork are the development of the plates for the arms and the legs. Okay, um, And the, the problem with the medieval artwork is that in this period, knights or men-at-arms wore various types of material covering over their torsos and for many parts over their legs as well, um, that you could call a surcoat and, uh, or ver various other names that were in use at the time. But basically that carries their heraldic device and so it was very important to them for identification and status and everything else to have their heraldic uh, clothing worn over their armour. For students of armour, the problem is it hides the development of the coat of plates. And so we only get to see the development of the coat of plates either in art where that outer heraldic garment has been taken off or stripped off, or sometimes in statues and effigies and things, brasses occasionally, where you see in the sides. So the heraldic covering covers the front and back, and very occasionally we see the sides of the armour, of the torso armour, underneath that uh, heraldic covering. 
Anyway, that's a massive topic and I'll cover the coated plates in more depth in a future video, definitely. Um, and people like Ian Laspina have, have covered this as well uh, on Knight Errant channel. Um, but the coated plates conventionally, if not always, involve plates being secured on the inside of the fabric. I think possibly, originally, this may have been for two purposes. Number one, it means that the plates are against your mail and the fabric is against the fabric. Just think about that for a second. So remember that the coat of plates was essentially sandwiched between a male hauberk and a heraldic fabric coat on the outside. And by putting the plates on the inside of the coat of plates, it means that the steel plates on the inside of here are against your male armor, okay? So they're just gonna, iron is gonna rub on iron, no big problem there. And then on the outer surface, the fabric or leather covering on the outside will rub against the uh, material of your heraldic coat, surcoat. So you've got no problem there because the fabric's not gonna damage the fabric, the iron is not gonna damage the iron, and these two are riveted to get together so they're not really gonna damage each other. If you put it the other way around, if you put the plates on the outside, you'd have iron plates rubbing against the surcoat and potentially ripping it to shreds if you're riding around for any amount of time. And on the inside, you've had the lever or the fabric over the top directly of your mail, uh, which might cause some kind of rucking or kind of uh, just generally the mail uh, wearing away at the um, inner surface of the uh, fabric covering underneath the plates and this kind of thing. So that's one possible idea. Another possible idea is that it's to do with essentially weatherproofing. Um, so remember that iron rusts and is a real nuisance like that. But if you have a fabric covering on the outside, it does mean that to some degree the iron or steel plates on the inside are protected from the elements, protected from the weather, which means less maintenance. Um, it also means you can colour this and you can make it look bright and you're not going to end up with horrible rusty um, iron and this kind of stuff. Um, and to some degree that helps protect also the male armour that's underneath there. As well and you have to remember that maintenance trying to keep rust off stuff in the medieval period must have been a constant battle um, and so I think that what happens when we get to the brigandine in the 15th and going into the 16th centuries as well but when we get into the 15th century is when the brigandine starts growing out of the corazina and the various forms of coat of plates that were around at the end of the 14th century I think what happens is they just continue that tradition of having the fabric over the iron. And I think you have to remember something else as well, that iron wasn't seen as a glamorous surface um, to have. Whereas now we have, the, we have the mental image of the shining knight or the steel, the shining steel warrior being this medieval kind of um, icon. Whereas actually if you look at medieval art, often we see helmets were painted, sometimes helmets were covered in fabric, we see breastplates, which are one-piece breastplates, sometimes covered in velvet, um, sometimes gilded, sometimes um, painted. So the fact is that the medieval people, the medieval mindset, liked bright colours and liked, you know, my brigandine happens to be black, but it could have been bright red, it could have had brocade patterns all over it, it could be bright green with lurid yellow flowers, and that would actually be more historically accurate than a black one, I should point out, incidentally. Black was not particularly... Uh, uh, widely used actually in this period um, but um, so bright colors gaudy colors showing off uh, also colors that relate to your heraldry as well if you are um, someone who has a coat of arms so I think that there are many, many things at play and many reasons why fabric was on the outer surface of the plates. Uh, but, and I did mention this earlier on in this video, there are exceptions to that. And occasionally we do see if you look at, for example, the Romance of Alexander um, from the 1340s, or if you look at various other sources, we do occasionally see a coat of plates or a brigandine or corazina where the plates for, uh, are like scales on the outside. And we do occasionally see that. I think in the Holcomb Bible, Holcomb Picture Bible is an example as well. So we do occasionally see the plates on the outside, it's just not normal and I think that's for the aforementioned reasons. Anyway, I'd be very interested to hear your input and your theories. I know some people watch this channel who are bigger armour experts than I am by a long margin. So I'd be fascinated to hear your ideas about why you think that the convention, for most if not all, maybe 90%, 
of multi-plate armours in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries was to have the plates on the inside and the fabric on the outside. Do you agree with the points I've made? Do you have additional points? Do you disagree with any of the points I've made? I'd be very interested to hear because I'm genuinely interested in discussing this topic um, and expanding my thinking on it because I think it's a very, very interesting subject to talk about. Anyway, uh, give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already and I'll see you really, really soon again for another armour video or something else weapon related on Scholar Gladiatura channel. Cheers folks! Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks!